And uh, let me just welcome you to First Baptist Church of Round Rock today. It is good to be back with you. Uh, I appreciate Kurt filling in for me last week, and we were able to worship with you guys online. And uh, uh, it gave me a chance to continue to try to figure out how to beat cedar pollen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I woke up last week and my eyes were red. And so thankfully, Kirk was already scheduled to preach, and he took care of that for me. But we're glad that you're here worshiping with us. And I know many of you are worshiping online this morning, and we are so glad that you've come to join us there online. Uh, if you are in the room, we'd love to, and, and a guest with us, we'd love it if you'd take the chance to fill out one of our connection cards. You can find that in the pew back there in front of you. Fill that out and you can drop it in your offering plate on your way out. Or in here or online, you can go to fbcrr.org slash connect. You can fill out the same connection card there. And uh, what we ask for, the reason we ask for that is just so that we can know who you are, but also so that you can share with us any prayer needs that you might have, um, any decisions that you make, questions about the church, um, anything that, that, that you need to connect with us about, uh, that's a way we can get back with you. And so if you do that, uh, we'll, we'll contact you this week and, and get in touch with you. Well, today we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to go ahead and preach. Is that all right? Some of y'all, some of y'all are like, "Wait, what? This isn't what we do. How we do it in Baptist churches?" Well, that's okay. Uh, we can switch things up a little bit, right? And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to preach for a little while, then we're going to worship some more, um, and then I'm going to come up and preach again. And so about three hours from now, we'll be done, and um, it'll be it'll be all good. But I am very excited about today. We're starting a new series called Forward in Faith. And you may be thinking, well, we've already done Forward in Faith. Well, we, we have. We've talked about that as, a, as our emphasis on trying to pay off that loan by the end of the year of 2021. And we did that by the power and the, and the provision of God. And I'm so excited that we were able to pay off that 450 thousand dollar loan that we had. Um, we got that paid off. And so, um, but if you remember all the way back in October when we began that, I said that forward in faith was much more than just trying to pay off a loan. Stepping forward in faith is something that we as a church and as individuals must do every single day of our life. And I believe that God has brought First Baptist Church of Round Rock to a pivotal point in its history. And it's 100, and, and now we're in our 174th year as a church, various names throughout the years, but same church meeting together for 174 years. That doesn't mean that some of you are 174 years old, um, but the church has been here for 174 years. And as we go through this series of Forward in Faith, I'm going to be sharing with you um, some essentials of what it means to be a church, some essentials that us, we as a church are going to try to carry out uh, over the next eight years and then culminating on February the 20th, uh, COVID allowing us to, we're planning to have a special one service Sunday where we all come together uh, in worship together and during one service. And in that service, the goal is to share with the church a vision that I believe God has brought us to, um, uh, that he's laid on my heart, laid on the heart of the staff, and laid on the heart of some of our uh, church and, and ministry leaders. And we've been talking about this. I'm so excited about it because it's been on my heart and our staff's heart ever since May when we were at our staff retreat. And we believe this is where God is leading us as a church uh, for the next eight years to go to 2030. What kind of church he wants us to be here in Round Rock. So we're going to have three weeks of talking about the essentials of for all churches who want to make a difference. Um, three weeks of kind of our outlining our focus as a church. And then on February the 20th, revealing to the church kind of what's going to be that directing vision for us as, uh, as we move forward together. And so if you read in the loop, uh, the January loop that came out, we had it planned for January the 30th. But because of this kind of rise in COVID, we're going to push it back to February the 20th, hoping that we kind of put some space. Maybe this spike will kind of drop down and we'll be able to come together um, in one service. So be sure to mark that on your calendar, February the 20th. That's going to be a very special day. Well, let's get into today's message and talk about moving forward with a great commandment, okay? Moving forward with a great commandment. We'll be in Matthew chapter 22, so go ahead and open up your Bibles there. In Matthew chapter 22, and in this passage, Jesus has been approached by a, uh, a religious leader, a teacher who is trying to trip him up. The, these, these guys were always trying to trip Jesus up and get him to say something that uh, would get him in trouble. And... Um, uh, Jesus always uh, got around it. He always was able to answer them in a way that really answered the question but avoided their trap. It's pretty incredible how he was able to do that. And so as we talk about moving forward with a great commandment, let's read from Matthew chapter 22, the great commandment that Jesus gives us. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. 
It says, teacher, this is that, that, law, that, that, that guy trying to trick Jesus. It says, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And so that question is supposed to try to get Jesus to pick one law out of all the Old Testament that would be the law that you're supposed to follow above all others. And, and he's hoping that Jesus will pick one that then they can say, oh, well, what about this? Or what about this? Or well, what about this? And get Jesus kind of in a conundrum. But Jesus answers in verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this answer by Jesus Christ as he answered, what is the greatest law? In all of the Old Testament was this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We thank you for that answer because it shows us how we are to live our life day by day. And if we can follow these two things, then all the other pieces of our life we're going to fall into place. And so Lord, help us to see how we can do that this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Jesus answered in that way. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and, all, and your mind. And Mark 12, 30 is a, is a similar passage. And he adds strength to that category. All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So your head, your heart, your hands, and your spirit are the ways that you are supposed to love uh, the Lord. Um, but I, I find it interesting that Jesus tagged this on there in verse 40. He says, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So in other words, if you want to attain, uh, if you want to be able to achieve all the laws, all the commands that were given in the Old Testament, then you can just focus on these two things, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you can achieve those two things, all the other laws of the Old Testament are going to fall into place. It's basically that's what Jesus is talking about. And so he's, and he specifically identifies the law and the prophets. So from Genesis to Deuteronomy and from Isaiah to Malachi are those two things that Jesus uh, kind of pinpoints. And so if you were to calculate it based on the New American Standard Version, that is 312,881 words. That's a lot of words, right? Um, and Jesus basically says you can sum up all 300,000 plus of those words in these 23 words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And a lot of times we pair that down to even a fewer, fewer words, four words, love God and love people. If you want to obey the Old Testament, if you want to obey the New Testament, if you want to live a life where you are following the Lord in obedience, then love God and love people is what the scripture says. And so I want to talk about that this morning. And as we get started, I want us to kind of look at our main point is this. Loving God and loving people is motivated and empowered by understanding the forgiving, loving grace of God we receive through faith in Jesus Christ. So let me just explain what this means. A lot of times whenever we talk about loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we, we begin with a list of to do's and to don'ts, Right. Uh, if you follow all these instructions, if you do all these things and don't do all these other things, then you will be loving God. But what that does is that puts a whole lot of weight, a whole lot of burden of, of self-motivated action on our hearts. And if you're like me, it seems like the more that you try out of your own strength to love God, the more you fail, the more you fail, and the more you fail. The more you're aware of the ways that you are failing in your life. And then that guilt just kind of piles on and piles on and piles on. How many of you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you have already fallen short on your uh, yearly Bible reading plan? I mean, you know, we're, we're just a couple of weeks in and there's probably already been some days you're like, I'm gonna do it every single day. And there was a day where you just didn't quite get to it. And if when we put that, that legalism on ourselves, then we can very quickly fall under the burden of guilt in our life. But when we realize that loving God and loving people is motivated and empowered by understanding the grace of God, it frees us to realize that really it is God working in us and through us to motivate us to action. Peter Kreeft, who is a Christian apologist, says, trusting God's grace means trusting God's love for us rather than our love for God. Therefore, our prayer should, cons should consist mainly of rousing our awareness of God's love for us rather than trying to rouse God's awareness of our love for Him. 
And what that means is that we need to be aware of God's love for us. And in so doing, that will then motivate our love to reciprocate back to Him. So let me give you four grace-motivated, grace-empowered ways to love God. The first one is to reciprocate His love, okay? Reciprocate His love. And basically what this means is that when we understand the forgiving and loving grace of God, it will help us to follow uh, or, or to reciprocate that love that He has already given us. You know, it's kind of like circular reasoning. God loves us, and because He loves us, we love Him. God loves us, and because we love, uh, He loves us, we love Him. It kind of goes in a circular pattern. The more that we're aware of and understand God's love, the more it motivates us to want to love Him. Jesus gave an example of this in Luke 7. He says in verse 41, A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, Jesus told him. You know, whenever we understand, whenever we realize the love that God has shown for us, shown to us, it causes us to want to love him more. And this really comes to, to play there at that moment of salvation. You know, some of you maybe have heard about God's love. Maybe you've, under, you've kind of tried to understand God's love, but you've never really come to a point where you realize God's love for you means that you can have salvation and eternal life. Or maybe you understand that, but you've never actually put your faith in God. Today, I would encourage you to reciprocate the love of God that He demonstrated for us on the cross through Jesus Christ and give your life over to Him. That is what grace does for us. You know, in that same story in Luke 7, uh, it's the story of a woman who came in and who, poured, uh, who, who, who gave a, a sacrifice, an offering of, of washing Jesus' feet. And, um, and nobody else did in the whole room. Nobody was able, was, did that for Jesus when he came in. But because of her faith and her desire to show love to him, he said in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Everything that we talk about today is based on this grace that we receive and recognizing God's love for us. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. It's just like my kids, you know, they love Melody and I, and it's really based because Melody and I first loved them. We loved them from the moment they were born, really before they were born, right? We loved them from the moment we knew that they were coming. And their love for us really grows out of our love for them. It's the same for God. Number two, we need to, how to love God, we follow his example. When we understand the, that forgiving and loving grace of God, it helps us to follow his example of love. In John 15, Jesus says, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love for this than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You know, Jesus is that living model, really an example of how to love others and how to love God uh, through a life of obedience. Jesus is that model. And it's interesting here that he says, this is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. And he basically says, if you are a friend to somebody, you will show your love for that friend by sacrificing your life for them, by giving your all for them. And then he says... And you are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, you know, a lot of times we kind of focus in on that, on that phrase, uh, uh, you're, uh, no one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. We talk about what it means to love our friends, love each other and, and things like that. But we often forget the fact that in the very next verse, Jesus says, and you are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, a friend shows his love by sacrificing his love for somebody, his, his life for somebody. And then Jesus says, and you are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, I want you, my friends, to sacrifice your life for me. In the same way that Jesus sacrificed his life for us, we are to turn around and sacrifice our love back to him, our, our life back to him. Um, you know, our, our kids can be another example of this. Kids tend to love their parents, follow their example in the same, you know, they, they follow our example by loving us in the same way that we love them, right? Um, Melody is, a, is, a, is more of a cuddler than I am. Now, I'm not saying I don't like cuddling with the kids, but Melody loves it. And so there, you'll often see Melody on the couch snuggling up with, you know, a couple of the kids and they're all, you know, up, bundled up under a cover or something like that, just snuggling on the couch. And uh, that's, they know that mommy loves to love that way. And so they show their love for mommy in that same way. Whereas I, ever since Preston was a little kid, I've been the tickle monster, Right. 
And so, you know, I'll pin the kids down and tickle them until they're just crying and laughing. And, um, and so now they'll come up to me and poke me or they'll tickle me and they're just waiting, right? There are certain key words that we have that are supposed to initiate a tickle fight. And so they'll come up to me and they'll try to initiate a tickle fight because they're reciprocating the way that I've loved on them by tickling them. They're doing the same thing back to me. And so we need to love God in the same way that he has shown his love for us by giving all of ourselves to him in obedience. The next thing that we see there goes into that. Obey his instruction. And uh, we understand the forgiving, loving grace of God, and it motivates us to want to obey his instruction. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And John 14, 21 says, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I also will love him and reveal myself to him. You know, there are times in the scripture where God says, hey, obey me because I said so, <laughs> right? He says that. And we as parents, have you ever said that? Yes, you have. Trust me. But there's a lot more times where God reminds the people, especially the Israelites, of how he has been faithful to them before. And then he asks them, based on that love, I want you now to obey my current instructions. And Jesus continues that into the New Testament. When we recognize that forgiving, loving grace of God that he has shown us in the past, it motivates us to love him and obey him in the present. Our obedience to God should not be uh, us trying really hard to obey God. It should be that we remind ourselves daily how much God has demonstrated his love for us, how much the grace of God uh, cost him, what all he has done for us. And when we think about it that way, it motivates us to obey him. And then finally, number four, under how to love God, we need to make God the priority. Understanding the forgiving, loving grace of God should cause us to want God to be the center of our life. You know, in Matthew 10, 37, it says, The one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You know, oftentimes in our culture, we prioritize other things before we prioritize God. You know, I talked about that Texas skyscraper a few weeks ago and how it goes up like 400 feet up in the air and you're spinning around in this swing and screaming, I guess, whenever you go around it. Um, you know, I'm okay to get on that swing and strap myself in and go up 400 feet because I know that that swing is attached to a center pole that's not going anywhere. A lot of times our life is spinning in circles and there's things going in all different kinds of directions and there's always something in the middle that is the priority in our life. Anytime there's a priority of family or a priority of business or a priority of uh, entertainment or sports, anytime there's a priority other than God, we have our skyscraper out of whack. You wouldn't put the pole in the swing and then strap the skyscraper to your entertainment or to your business and then expect it to go around or work, right? Or strap it to yourself and expect it to go around and work. It would be out of balance. Whenever we have God at the center of our life, everything else is in balance. Everything else will work in the right way. And when we get God on the outside, everything is out of whack. We need to make sure that God is the center. God is the priority in our life. And when we do that, the obedience will come out. The, the love for God that motivated the love that is motivated by his grace is going to demonstrate itself more and more and more. And so the first part of this great commandment is that we be a people who loves God. And we're gonna, I'm going to bring the, the praise team back up. And so here's what we're going to do. With that understanding, with that understanding of that, that the center, central part of who we are as individuals and as a church needs to be that we are motivated by that grace, gracious, forgiving love of God. And whenever we recognize that gracious, forgiving love of God, it's going to spur us on to greater obedience and greater work for Him. With that understanding, I want you to join us in worship as we continue to worship the Lord this morning. We're going to, you know, it's uh, something interesting came to my mind as we were singing that song that, you know, God is clothed in rainbows of color. You know, whenever the scripture talks about Jesus, especially in John chapter 1, it refers to him as the light. You know, there's a lot of light that we can't see. There's a lot of light in the light spectrum that we can't see. And since Jesus is that perfect light, and we're going to know him fully as we are fully known, I just imagine, just imagine what Jesus is going to look like when we get to heaven. 
and we can see him in perfect light, which I think means every single type of light that is expressed is going to be a part of Jesus, and we're going to see him fully. It's just going to be an amazing, amazing thing. Well, that has nothing to do with the message, but it just came to mind during the time we praise the Lord. So thanks for worshiping God. You know, that's what we want to do. We want to love the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And we talked about a little bit about how to do that. But one thing that is motivated by grace and motivated by love, motivated by that forgiveness, as we love God, the second thing that Jesus talks about, loving others, loving people, loving your neighbor as yourself, is going to flow out of that, right? As God's love is poured more and more into our cup and we're aware of it more and more, it's going to overflow. And when it overflows, hopefully it will overflow to other people. And so quickly, I want to give you two things that um, kind of help us to understand how to love people with a grace-motivated, forgiveness-aware love. That as we understand and what God has done for us, it'll motivate us to love others. And before we talk about those two things, I want to just give you an example. Uh, You may have heard of the name Richard Wormbrand. He's one of my favorite um, saints of old. And he was uh, was a a pastor in Romania during uh, World War II and during the communist Um, Russian occupation there, but he was born in uh, 1909. He was a brilliant man. He was fluent in nine languages. Uh, He married Sabina, who was his wife. In fact, Lifeway Films just came out with a movie about her. And whenever you ever come across that, I would encourage you to watch that. It's a great movie. Um, But they placed their faith in Jesus in 1938 as a result, listen to this, of the witness of a German carpenter in Romania. During World War II, Richard and Sabrina, Sabina saw opportunities and used opportunities to evangelize the occupying German forces. So as the Germans came in to occupy Romania, Richard and Sabina were out there witnessing to them and sharing the gospel. They were repeatedly arrested and beaten and almost executed by the Germans. And in fact, Sabina's family was killed in a German concentration camp. In 1945, the, uh, the communists seized power and the Russian troops came in and began an occupation that was brutal. But in the midst of that, the Wormbrands ministered to them. They ministered to the soldiers and they ministered to their fellow countrymen there in the country. And in 19, uh, 1948, uh, after Richard had spoke out passionately about the uh, secularism of the Communist Party and how uh, the Christians were just sort of caving into that, he spoke out and said, we have to follow God first. Uh, almost immediately, he was arrested in 1948, and he was uh, put into prison uh, where he was brutally treated. And in 1950, Sabina was arrested and put into a forced labor camp on a canal project. And they, th- whenever they were arrested, the soldiers and the, or the police just left their nine-year-old son at home by himself with nobody to care for him. Families took him in at risk uh, of, uh, to their own uh, s- safety. Finally, uh, Sabina was released after three years, but uh, Richard was in and out of prison all the way until 1964 when he was finally released, over uh, uh, almost 20 years that he was there. December 1965, uh, some people paid $10,000 to ransom them out of Romania and give them their freedom. And as they got out of Romania and began to experience the freedom uh, there in England and then later in the United States, in 1967, Richard began a ministry. I want you to listen to the name of his ministry. It was called Jesus to the Communist World. After all that he had experienced at the hands of uh, the Nazi party and at the hands of the occupying Russian communists that were there in Romania, he began a ministry specifically back to the communist people, the communist, uh, uh, those in communism. Today, that same ministry is called Voice of the Martyrs, which you may have heard of. And so R- Richard and Sabina give us an example of how to love others. Okay, their example is, it shows us two things that, that really Jesus shows us as well of how to love other people. Because I want you just to, as best you can, put yourself in their shoes. All that these people had done to them to their friends, to their family, yet they love them with the love of Jesus. And so the first thing that we see how to love others is, first of all, love sacrificially. As we understand the forgiveness and the grace that we have experienced through Jesus Christ at the hands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, our Father God, um, 
we should love others sacrificially in the same way that they have loved us. That passage that I read earlier, John 15, 13, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. We are to love sacrificially in the same way that we lay our life down for Jesus. We are also to follow his example and lay our, down, our lives down for one another. We need to be people who are motivated by the grace and love we have experienced and hand that same grace and love off to other people. You know, and um, uh, I think in David gives us a good example of what this kind of, what the underlying reason behind this is. In, in 2 Samuel 24, 24, he's, is, um, uh, somebody's trying to give him an offering that he can give to God. And they're going to give it to him free of charge. They just want to give him an offering so that he can then give it to God. And then, but he says, no, I insist on buying it from you for a price, for I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and oxen for 20 ounces of silver. And so he's going to give this, you know, this to the Lord. And somebody's like, no, no, just take it and give it to him. He says, no, if I'm going to give it to God, it has to cost me something. And whenever we understand the love that we have given and how much that love cost God, because it cost God everything. Jesus had to leave heaven, take on the form of a man, live a perfect life, and then die on the cross, our death, even though he was innocent. He endured all of that because of his love for us. And when we realize that, we realize what it really costs to love somebody, then we're willing to give all that we have to love Jesus. And a part of that means giving all that we have to love other people. And so our love for each other is motivated by the love that we've already experienced. And so whenever you think about, oh, do I, how much do I have to love somebody? Well, you just think, well, I love them the same amount that Jesus loved me. Okay, well, let me calculate that. (laughs) You know, when when we think about it that way, we understand what it means to love sacrificially. And then secondly, and we see this in Jesus and we see this in the Worm Brands example, we need to love everyone. And I put out there, yes, even blank, because I know somebody has come to your mind, right? You know, do I have to love this person? Or this person is so hard to love, or this group of people is so hard to love, they disagree with me on philosophically on all different kinds of things. You know, do we really have to love them? Yes. If they are humans with breath in their lungs, you are, you're supposed to love them the same way that Jesus loved us. He didn't have categories for who he loved, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so God loves the entire world. Every single person who has ever breathed breath, God loves them. And so we need to love everyone as well. In John 13, it says, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You are to also love one another. Verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So that one's easy, right? It's, it's easy to love the people that are in this room. Well, most of us, right? You know, there's, there's a couple of us, you know, that might be a little difficult at times. But it's generally pretty easy to love those of us that are in the household of God, that are part of our, our faith family. But then Jesus says in another place, Matthew chapter 5, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? You know, it's uh, easy for us to criticize those who disagree with us. Maybe they're on the different side of the political aisle from you, and so you're critical of those people. Or maybe they have a different philosophy on certain uh, morals or certain things that we believe as believers. It's easy to criticize people like that, but it's a whole lot harder to love them. It's more difficult to love them. But the way that we can find ourselves loving those, even those that disagree with us so far to one side or the other, is to remember that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what it says in Romans 5, 8. God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, that word, that world of, of hate or disdain or maybe of just blocking somebody out and not even thinking about them, that's the easy road, right? And when it comes right down to it, loving someone is the difficult road. And Jesus talks about that in the context of salvation. He says, it's easy to go the road of the world, to go in the direction where you uh, are not following God. But that road of following God, that is narrow and few find it. 
Well, I believe it's the same when we love those people that are oftentimes hard to love. Maybe we're loving those people that are unlovely, right? It's easy to go the direction where we just ignore them or we don't like them or we let that hate or bitterness maybe because of things that they've done creep up into our life. That's the easy path. The rough road, the hard road is when we choose to love them with the love of God. The same way that he has meted it out to us, we give it back to them. But you know, the rough roads do something for us. You ever been driving uh, on a nice, smooth highway and you just kind of feel yourself being lulled to sleep? Or maybe you, you just kind of daydream, you're kind of getting drowsy, maybe you're not focusing as much. Have you ever noticed that if you're driving on a rough road, you're much more alert because you're looking for the pothole? Like it's kind of like whenever you cross into Louisiana, all of a sudden you wake up, right? <laughs> You have to wake up because you know there's a giant pothole that your tire is going to fall into. Um, so we, when you're on a rough road, you're alert because you're looking for those bumps. You're trying to avoid it. You're getting jarred around. You, you, when you have a rough road, it keeps you awake, but it also does something else to you. When you're, when you're on a smooth road, you don't have to go to the mechanic quite as often, right? Because your car is not getting beat up. But if you drive on a rough road, you have to go to the mechanic a lot often. You got to get your car aligned. You got to get your tires rotated more. You know, you got to do all those things because you live on a rough road or you drive a rough road. The rougher roads make us keep going back to God because it means that we're relying on him to see us through even more. Whenever you're trying to love somebody who's that rough road, you have to keep going back to God because only with the love of God pouring through your life are you truly going to be able to love them. But you know, one thing I've learned is that a lot of times, some of those amazing discoveries lie at the end of a rough road. How many of you have ever heard of this little town called Crystal, Colorado? You know, if you, maybe, maybe some of you have ever heard of that. I don't see any hands going up. Crystal, Colorado is out on the western side of Colorado, and it's an old uh, mining ghost town. And Melody and I decided when we lived up there one time, we were going to go to Crystal, Colorado. And, and you may have seen this picture before, something like this. This is a water mill that's a famous water mill that's there in Crystal, Colorado. And I didn't take this picture. I wish I had. I've got a picture like this, but I have stood in that spot. Okay, I've stood in that spot. It's three miles from where the paved road ends to get to there. And it took us an hour to go that three miles. Four low in the Jeep, getting there, crawling over rocks, looking down at the cliff at the burned out blazer that's down below. That kind of driving. That was on Melody's side. She was okay. Um, but you know what? We saw this amazing scene at the end of that rough road. And I wonder what amazing scene of love could be at the end of the rough road that you have of loving somebody with the love of Jesus. It may not be easy, it may be very difficult at times. But if you love somebody with the love of Jesus, at the end of that rough road, a lot of times we see beautiful things happen. We see salvation come to their life. We see joy come back into their life. We see restored relationships come back into their life. Those things are difficult, but man, aren't they worth it? Aren't they worth it? That's what it means to love others. We love sacrificially and we love everyone. And we're going to talk about next week how that rolls into the, another thing of love is that we share the love of Christ with them so that they too can come to salvation. We've got a men's group that are going to come up and, and lead us in an invitational song. As they do, I just want you this morning to let the awareness of the love that God has for you wash over your heart. I want you just to remember the love that he demonstrated for you on the cross when Jesus Christ took the nails that were meant for us, when he took the wrath of God that was meant for us, when he took all the punishment of hell that was meant for us, he took it on himself. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he paid the price for our sin. Can you imagine that love? Can you imagine that grace? I want you just to picture that grace for you in your life as we have this invitation time. And then pray, God, because of that grace, because of that awareness of that grace and love in my life, help me to love you better and help me to love others with the love of Jesus.